The 2004 and 2005 World Series brought two sweeps and long droughts by teams named after Sox, but the difference is that the 2005 series was an absolute compelling four-game series, featuring tight, close games, with the heroics on and off the mound, and what is one of the best World Series despite it being a sweep. So let's look at the best four-game World Series of all time. Totally sports-esque. Major League. Far away from the monstrosity known as the 2024 White Sox, the 2004 White Sox finished 83-79 for their third straight second place finish in the AL Central. And as for the Astros, they also finished second in their division for the third straight year, that being the NL Central. The difference being they still made the playoffs, where they beat the Braves in five games in the NLDS, but after Jim Edmonds' walk-off home run in Game 6 of the NLCS, they would lose the next night to their then-division rivals in the Cardinals. So there were still high hopes for both of these teams, with the Astros hoping to finally make it over the hump after years of making the playoffs, and not getting past the NLCS, while the White Sox were just trying to make the playoffs, and both would accomplish those goals. Of course, before the Astros got there, they also had to make the playoffs, and things did not start out well, beginning the year at 15 and 30, but they won 74 of their final 117 games to once again capture the wild card with three all-star pitchers in Roger Clemens, Brad Lidge, and Roy Oswald, along with the most experienced postseason pitcher of all time and Andy Pettit. Their pitching that had the second best ERA in the league was what carried them, and the White Sox were pretty similar, except there wasn't a day in the season where they weren't in first place. In the second year of Ozzie Guillen's tenure, he led a makeover of the team that focused on small ball and a team-first attitude, bringing in the likes of Scott Pesednik, Jermaine Dye, A.J. Przinski, Orlando Hernandez, Freddy Garcia, Bobby Jenks, and more. And they exemplified that attitude throughout the season. After winning 17 in April, they were 68-35 by the end of July, holding a 14.5 game lead. But that lead would drop all the way down to 1.5 in August, before the White Sox caught fire again in September, winning 8 of their last 10 to win 99 games, and win the AL Central with the best record in the American League, with Paul Canerco leading the offense with 40 home runs, and just like the Astros, the White Sox had the second best ERA in their league. And that set them both up for two interesting divisional series matchups. The Astros were in a rematch against the Braves, while the White Sox were going against the defending champion Red Sox, who the year prior ended their World Series drought dating back to 1918. And funny enough, the last time the White Sox had won it all prior was in 1917. The Red Sox curse was known as the Curse of the Bambino, and the White Sox curse became known as the Curse of the Black Sox. After the White Sox lost the 1919 World Series on purpose, after it was discovered they bet against themselves on FanDuel. And not only was this their latest World Series title, that was the last time the White Sox won a playoff series. And Ozzie Guillen reminded them that they shouldn't just be happy about making the playoffs, and they should want more. And they took that to heart in Game 1, and the White Sox would win 14-2, with four players hitting home runs, and Jose Contreras pitching 7.2 innings, giving up two runs. And the Astros' bats also broke through in their game one. Things were back and forth throughout the game, until the eighth inning, when the Astros broke through for five runs, as he ended up winning 10-5, feeling great knowing Roger Clemens was on the mound for game two. But that didn't go well. After Brian McCann became the first brave rookie to homer in his first postseason at bat with a three-run home run in the second, that was all John Spoltz needed, as he held the Astros to one run, to send things to Houston tied at one. In the White Sox game two, Mark Burley got his first career postseason start, and like Clemens, he was a little shaky, giving up four runs and eight hits over seven innings, but he left with the lead, as in the fifth after scoring two runs. An error was made on a Juan Uribe ground ball to put two runners on, and one of the players Ozzie Guillen hand-selected from Japan, Tadahito Iguchi, came up and hit a three-run home run, which would be the difference as the White Sox won 5-4 to go up 2-0 on their way to Fenway. Ofe is not feeling completely safe, considering the White Sox history, and the fact that this Red Sox team just became the only team to come back from a 3-0 deficit the previous year. But before that, the Astros and Braves had their Game 3, and the Astros jumped on Jorge Sosa for 2 in the first inning, but the Braves would tie things in the top of the second, that is until Mike Lamb hit a go-ahead home run in the bottom of the third. And after Roy Oswald pitched 8, and they added 4 in the 7th, they won 7-3, but then one went away from their second straight NLCS. Meanwhile, back in Boston, Freddie Garcia and Tim Wakefield were on the mound, and the scoring began in the third, with two runs from the White Sox, with forcing two runs from the Red Sox with back-to-back -back home runs. But in the sixth, Paul Canerco would hit a two-run home run, and despite another Manny Ramirez home run, the Red Sox could not catch up as Bobby Jenks got the final three outs. And for the first time since 1917, the White Sox had won a playoff series. The White Sox got a nice break for the quick sweep, but the Braves and Astros almost played an entire series in Game 4. Tim Hudson was on the mound, and what's crazy is this would be one of two 18-inning playoff games that he started, and he got a cushion when Adam LaRoche hit a grand slam in the third, with a lead that grew to five in the fifth. Then went back down to four after the bottom half, but another Brian McCann home run in the eighth grew the lead back to five, with assumptions that things were going back to Atlanta, 
the Astros rallied in the bottom half. Hudson's day ended, and after Luke Scott walked, the bases were loaded, and one of the most underrated postseason players in Lance Berkman would hit a huge grand slam to cut the lead down to one, marking the only playoff game with two grand slams. The Astros couldn't add any more, but they cut in the ninth with two outs, and Brad Ausmus would hit the game-tying solo home run of Kyle Farnsworth, which sent things to extra innings for a pretty long time. Both teams had trouble driving in runners for extras. Luke Scott just missed a walk-off home run in the 11th that hooked foul. Brad Lynch escaped in the 11th inning with runners on 2nd and 3rd with 1 out. Then Dan Wheeler escaped a bases loaded jam in the 14th, before Jim Brower escaped a jam in the 15th. With a double play that sent things to the 16th, where Roger Clemens came in with the Astros out of pitching. This is the second time in his career that he came out of the bullpen. And he would fire three scoreless innings, bringing things to the bottom of the 18th, already where no postseason game had gone before. With the closest also featuring the Astros in Game 6 of the 1986 NLCS that went 16 innings. But things would not go to the 19th when Chris Burke would hit a walk-off solo home run with one out to send the Astros to the NLCS, a ball caught by the same fan who caught Lance Berkman's grand slam. It was labeled as the greatest moment in Astros history to that point and made fans figure that this would be their year. But standing in their way was the team who beat them the previous year and the division winners in the 100-win Cardinals. And though Chris Burke stayed hot and hit a two-run home run in Game 1, it wasn't until the 7th when they were already down 5. They added another in the 9th, but they couldn't add any more as the Cardinals took Game 1 over Andy Pettit and the Astros. Meanwhile, the White Sox were back from their break, and this time they were facing the Angels and the ALCS. And all the runs came early. The Angels added 3 over the first 3, and AJ Przezinski's single made it a 1-run game in the 4th. But neither team scored after, as despite Jose Contreras scoring 8.1 innings, the White Sox would lose their first playoff game as Francisco Rodriguez closed things out. This naturally meant Game 2 was huge for both teams. The Astros needed to take one on the road, and the White Sox couldn't afford to go down two games before going to LA. And the story in Game 2 was the Astros pitching. Two of their three all-star pitchers appeared in this game, and none more. Roy Oswald pitched the first seven, giving up one run on an Albert Pujols home run, while Brad Lynch pitched the final two, as the Astros put up four runs along the way to win 4-1 to to send things to Houston tied at one, unlike the previous year. And then there was a memorable and controversial Game 2 of the ALCS. Jermaine Dye drove in a run on the ground out in the first, and the only runoff Mark Burley would be scored in the fifth, with Rob Quinlan's home run. The score remained tied at one, as Burley would pitch all nine innings. Kelvin Escobar got the first two out in the bottom of the ninth, then he appeared to get the third, when A.G. Przinski swung and missed at strike three in the dirt. Josh Paul rolled the ball to the mound as the Angels walked off the field, and with strike three not yet called, Brzezinski ran to first just in case. And he remained at first, as after a discussion, umpires controversially ruled that it was a drop through a strike, and Przinski was given first. And that call became even more controversial when pinch runner Pablo Zuna stole second, the Joe Crady drove him in with a single to win the game. Though controversial, this was a clear sign that it was the White Sox year. And it continued to look that way when they immediately scored three runs at the top of the first in Game 3, thanks in part to Paul Canerco's two-run home run. They had won the third and the fifth, and even with Orlando Cabrera's two-run home run, John Garland threw the White Sox second straight complete game as he won 5-2. In Game 3 in Houston didn't get off to the same start, but Mike Lamb's two-run home run got the scoring started in the fourth. The Cardinals would manage to tie things with one over the next two, but the Astros responded with two in the bottom of the sixth and led by two going into the ninth. Brad Lidge got the first two in the ninth before John Rodriguez walk and a John Mabry double that scored a run. The first run the Cardinals scored off Brad Lidge in over two years. They didn't add any more though, as Roger Clemens would pick up his 12th playoff win, and the Astros would get their second win of the series. In Game 4, in the ALCS was nearly the same as Game 3. The White Sox again put up 3 in the first, as Paul Canerco again hit a home run to drive in 3 runs, to become the third player to ever hit first inning home runs in back-to-back -back playoff games. And just like Game 2 and 3, a White Sox pitcher threw a complete game, this time being Freddy Garcia, with White Sox relievers needing to just get 2 outs through the first 4 games, as they were 1-1 away from their first pennant since 1959. And Game 4, the NLCS, was also similar to 3. The scoring again started in the 4th, when both teams scored 1. And though Jason Marquis was strong, it was a Jason Lane home run in the 7th that was the difference, as again the Cardinals couldn't tie things off Lidge. But they continued to see it, unlike Tony La Russa, who became the first manager since 1998 to be ejected from a postseason game. For the first time since Game 1, the White Sox didn't score in the first inning. But they did in the 2nd, with the Angels erasing a deficit for the first time at home, with a run in the 3rd. The White Sox would take the lead back in the fifth with a Jermaine Dye single, then the Angels got their first lead since game one with a Figgins double, and a Garrett Anderson sack fly. But in the seventh, Joe Creedy would tie the game with a home run. Then one inning later, he would hit a go-ahead single off Francisco Rodriguez. 
The White Sox added two insurance runs in the ninth, and for the fourth straight game, a White Sox pitcher threw a complete game, this being Jose Contreras, working the first time since the 1907 Cubs in the World Series that four pitchers recorded complete game victories. And for the first time in 46 years, the White Sox were going to the World Series, as Paul Konerko would receive ALCS MVP as they awaited their NL Central opponent. And with the Astros one win away, it was a great pitching matchup of Chris Carpenter and Andy Pettit. And it was the Astros who struck first in the second with a Craig Biggio single. But the Cardinals took the lead with a two-run single from Mark Rezlon. Two-run score held into the seventh when Lance Berkman came to Puge again with a three-run home run. And the World Series looked inevitable as Brad Lidge came out with a two-run lead and the Houston fans were loud as he got the first two-run strikeouts. But another underrated postseason player in David Eckstein would keep things alive with a single. And Jim Edmonds followed that with a walk. The last thing he wanted to do as up to the plate came Albert Pools. That year's MVP took a pitch, then on the second pitch, Pools launched the ball to the tracks, defining a crowd-silencing home run that Andy Pettit called the farthest ball he's ever seen hit. Jason Isringhausen would get the final three, which kept the series alive, and guaranteed Bush Stadium 2 got at least one more game. That Pools home run became so infamous that many forget what happened after, but Astros fans definitely remember. The Astros had to shake things off, and a strong start by Roy Oswell really helped. Oswald pitched four scoreless to start, and he was aided by two runs from the Astros in the third, and a Jason Lane home run in the fourth. The Cardinals scored their only run in the fifth on a sack fly, as Oswald would pitch seven innings, picking up one run, leaving the game with a 5-1 lead. Chad Qualls pitched the eighth, and Dan Wheeler took the role of Lidge, and got the final three outs, and for the first time in their history, the Astros are going to the World Series. The Troy Oswald would take home the NLCS MVP, as they made their way to the south side, for the first World Series game in Chicago since 1959. And the White Sox first World Series in 46 years, they continued to do what they had been doing. Jose Contreras set down the Astros in order, then Jermaine Dye hit a solo home run in the first. But the lead didn't last long, as Mike Lamb hit the first home run in Astros World Series history in the second. But that lead didn't last long, as the White Sox added two in the second, which Clemens didn't make it out of, in part because of his hamstring, as this was the shortest World Series outing of his career. And that lead didn't last long either, as the Astros added two in the third with a Lance Berkman single. And as you may expect, that lead didn't last long, as in the bottom of the fourth, Joe Creedy hit a solo home run. These four innings were just a preview of what was to come, very back and forth, with the White Sox still ending up on top. The 4-3 scored remained to the seventh, where Contreras was taken out. The White Sox used their bullpen for the first time in five games, with Neil Kotz who got the first two. Ozzy Guillen came out and stretched his arms out wide and high to let everyone know that Bobby Big Boy Jenks was coming into the game. He got the out, and Scott Pesednik would hit an RBI triple for insurance, and Jenks would get the final out as just like 1959, the White Sox won game one. And really, this was the worst game of the series, which is saying a lot. It was cold and rainy in game two, and the scoring started with a Morgan Ensberg home run off Mark Burley in the second. But of course, the White Sox responded with two in the bottom half, off Andy Pettit, who was making his 11th World Series start, and the only one not as a Yankee. But just like game one, the Astros tied things thanks to Lance Berkman this time on a sack fly. And again, it was Berkman in the fifth, who would hit a two-run double. Despite all this, Burley lasted until the seventh, giving up four runs and seven hits. Actually less hits than what Pettit gave up in his six innings. And the seventh is where things change. Dan Wheeler came in, and after striking out Pesednik, there were two outs with Juan Uribe at second. But Wheeler proceeded to walk Aguchi and hit Jermaine Dye, prompting a pitching change for Qualls to face the ALCS MVP in Paul Canerco. And on his first pitch, he was greeted with a grand slam from Canerco that sent U.S. Cellular Field into a frenzy. But things weren't done, as a 6-4 score held going into the ninth with Bobby Jenks in. Jeff Bagwell led off with a single, Jenks got Lane to strike out, then walked Chris Burke before getting Ausmus to ground out, which moved the runners to second and third. And that left things up to pinch hitter Jose Vizcaino. And on one pitch, he would hit a single to left that would tie the game. A similar hit to his walk-off in Game 1 of the 2000 World Series. Bobby Jenks was replaced by Cots, who got the last out, but things were tied at six going to the bottom half. And into the game came Brad Lidge, looking for redemption after his previous outing. And he looked good getting Juan Uribe to fly out to start. And he didn't have too much to worry about in terms of power, as up to the plate came Scott Pesetton. The definition of a contact guy, he made 568 plate appearances that season and had approximately zero home runs. So it would be best not let last year's stolen base leader get on. But Pesetton said you don't have to worry about that, as he would hit the 14th walk-off home run in World Series history, and his second home run of the postseason, arguably the biggest hit in White Sox history, and one that was massive, and sent the White Sox to Houston up 2-0. The World Series went to Texas for the first time in history, 
and Astros fans had prepared themselves well for never-ending games. And it was all Houston in the start. Lance Berkman stayed hot by driving in Craig Biggio in the first, and after killing a rally in the second, Biggio and Ensberg hit RBI singles in the third, and the lead would go to four in the fourth when Jason Lane hit a solo home run as Roy Oswalt was cruising to that point. But things changed in the fifth. Joe Creedy led off for the home run, and four of the next five would hit singles to make things a one-run game. Paul Konerko flew out, then A.G. Przinski would hit a two-run double, which gave the White Sox the lead, erasing a four-run deficit in the matter of one-half inning. Oswald escaped the bases loaded to end the inning and pitched the sixth before being taken out in the seventh, which was John Garland's last inning, as he came out with the White Sox winning. Cliff Pollock came in and politely got the first two of the bottom of the eighth out, but walked Ensberg, prompting Guillen to go with Kotz, who walked Lamb, prompting Guillen to go with Hermanson. And on a two-strike count, Lane would hit a double that brought in a run, and now things were tied at five, where it would stay for a while. Brad Lidge would finish the ninth, and after a loud inning, World Series veteran Orlando Hernandez made it out of the ninth. The Astros had loud innings over the 10th and 11th, but couldn't capitalize either time, and the 12th and 13th were quiet for both teams, as the pitchers were settling in. But the top of the 14th started with the Jermaine Dye single. However, Paul Canerico hit into an incredible double play started by Ensberg, which looked to be the rally killer. That is until Jeff Blum had something to say, as on the second pitch he saw, he would have had a go-ahead solo run to bring their win probability to 81%. And they were done. They proceeded to hit two singles and walk twice to add in another crucial run. With Jinx having already pitched the 11th and 12th, Demasa Marte came in looking to get the save, and he started things with a strikeout before issuing a walk and getting a pop-out. Needing to get one more, Brad Ausmus would reach on an E6 as runners were on the corners after a defensive indifference. And that prompted Guillen to bring in game two starter, Mark Burley. And three pitches later, he got Everett to pop out, making him the first pitcher since Bob Turley in 1958 to start a game and record a save in the World Series. As the White Sox took a commanding 3-0 lead in what was the longest World Series game ever at the time, at 5 hours and 41 minutes. With their backs against the wall, White Sox were sent Freddy Garcia to the mound against Brandon Back. And this was the pitcher's duel that had been expected since the start. They were both dealing reminiscent of John Smoltz and Jack Morris in 1991. As for the first time since their duel in 91, a World Series game started with seven scoreless innings, both striking out seven over seven, making this the fourth straight game where the White Sox had a pitcher go at least seven innings. And in desperation mode, the Astros sent Brad Lidge out there in the eighth, and Willie Harris led things off for the single. Instead of using his powerful power, Scott Pesednik decided to lay down a bunt to advance Harris, who advanced to third on Carl Everett's ground out to second, and that brought up Jermaine Dye, another veteran hand-selected by Ozzy Guillen, and on the third pitch from Lidge, Dye hit a grounder at the middle that got through and drove in the go-ahead run. Cots would end the jam Pollock got into in the bottom of the eighth, and Brad Lidge would pitch his final inning of the postseason in the ninth in a postseason that did not end the way it started. And that brought in Jinx, looking to give the White Sox their first title since 1917, as the 1919 White Sox looked on, sweating the live bets they just placed. And it got sweatier when Lane let off the inning with a single. Osmus proceeded to bunt him over to put the tying run at second, and on the sixth pitch of the at-bat, Chris Burke hit a pop fly into fall territory, and Juan Uribe ran over to make an incredible catch in the stands, one of the most underrated plays in World Series history. And now Orlando Palmero was their last hope, and as he went down 1-2, he would hit a chopper over Jenks' head, and Uribe made another great play that had no chance to be reviewed, and for the first time in 88 years, the White Sox were World Series champions. It's easy to write off any series that only goes four games, but this four-game series was better or just as good as many six- or seven-game series, and it can be backed up by more than just opinion. In terms of game leverage, this was the tightest World Series in history. In all four games, things were either tied or within one run in the eighth inning or later. The largest lead in all four games was by the Astros in the fourth, who were leading by four, and that lead was gone by the next inning. In those four games, there was a back-and-forth game one, a walk-off home run from out of nowhere in game two, a 14-inning battle in Game 3, and a pitcher's duel in Game 4, with a clutch hit by the World Series MVP in Jermaine Dott. It was everything you could ask for in a World Series, and it was all packed in a four-game series. And the White Sox resilience was the reason it was only four games. They had a motto of win or die trying, different than the 2024 White Sox motto of we died trying. And that's exactly what the 2005 White Sox did. As they won their last five regular season games, and went 11 and won the playoffs, making their 16 and 1 stretch over their last 17 games the greatest end to a season in baseball history. And this season was an anomaly given their history. In the first 104 seasons of White Sox baseball, they won two playoff series, meaning they won more playoff series in one year than they did in the previous 104. 
A lot of those years had just the World Series, but the point stands. And in the grand scheme, this series and the White Sox team seems to be somewhat forgotten, and in part has to do with the timing. The talk of sports throughout 2004 was the Red Sox ending their curse, so the White Sox ending a two-year longer drought fell under the radar, especially from the media sense, backed up by the multiple times the media forgot about the 2005 White Sox when the Cubs broke their curse in 2016. But that kind of exemplifies the team and the White Sox, a team with a perfect mix of power, small ball, tough pitching, veterans, and loud and quiet personalities led by their loud manager. And they were different than the 2004 Red Sox or the 2016 Cubs, in that they just absolutely cruised to a title, having to come back in a lot of games, but never having real doubt that they may lose a series, like 102 of the previous 104 White Sox teams. And now maybe the White Sox will hire a former manager like they like to do, and Ozzy Guillen will lead the greatest turnaround in history, as the 2025 White Sox will go 121-41 and sweep through the playoffs. Hopefully you like this video, and if so, please consider liking and subscribing for new videos every week. Thank you.